Hello, and thank you for listening to the Okta podcast. This episode, we have a special guest author, Russell Wangerski. His newest book, Same Ground, Chasing Family Down the California Gold Rush Trail, is available in stores and online at the link in this episode's description. Wangerski's work is all about family. It's about being an immigrant who made the choice to leave where his family was from. It's about reconnecting with old family history and retracing their steps and experiences. Having the ability to do something like this through journals and preserved family histories is something that I feel is quite rare these days, and Wangerski really makes the most of it. Well, uh, I'm a... Russell Mungerski. I'm a journalist, an author, a columnist, an editor. Um, I've been in uh, print journalism for 35 years. I've been an author. I've written uh, seven books. This is my eighth variety, uh, novels, short story collections, um, uh, memoir of the six and a half years I spent as a firefighter and what it did to me and my family and my world, which was kind of blow it up at the time. Um, and now I'm the editor in chief of two Western Canadian newspapers, daily newspapers, the Regina Leader Post and the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. Before that, I was a columnist for roughly 20 years with the St. John's Telegram in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, which is probably most recognizable as the, as, as the most Eastern point in North America is, is in, on the East coast of Newfoundland. Can you talk a little bit about your process for writing this book? I know in the introduction, you kind of mentioned that these letters that you um, share throughout the book, you, they were in your family for a long time and you knew of them growing up. So why now have you chosen to, to go into this story? Uh, in, in a way, it's to, to try and make up for, you know, past mistakes. You end up doing that a lot in life. But uh, after I started writing and, and wrote the first couple of books, my, my dad said to me, and we had said throughout my life, but he had said to me, you really should look at your mother's uh, great-grandfather's diary of his gold rush travels because this it should be published. You should you should find a way to publish this. And I, you know, as you often do when your parents suggest something, I said, yeah, well, I'll I'll, I'll get to that. Don't worry. And 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 uh, he passed away before I did anything with it. But I was always when I was young, when I was three, we moved. I was born in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. We moved to Canada when I was three. Um, left behind a lot of American family members that I saw only briefly after that or not at all. And I would run into other families that had big family events and uh, were all interconnected and finished each other's sentences and knew all of the family stories and could recite them sequentially with different members of the family using different parts of their conversation. And I wondered, you know, why don't I have that? Why doesn't that exist in my family, which was basically a small nuclear family, mom, dad, my two brothers, we were it. Um, the Wengerskis were very small in number. Uh, I think I can count three that weren't actually in our nuclear family. It's not a common name. Um, there were many more Dodges, uh, but we basically disconnected from them. And, and, and after dad died and after my mother died, I started looking at the diary and thinking, oh, this is a spectacular diary for a 22-year-old to decide to set out from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, go to St. Louis, then to St. Joe's, Missouri, and then cross the United States as a 22-year-old, writing in a kind of um, care and precise language that I wouldn't have had at 22. Um, you know, I read what he says and I think, man, he writes like a 45 year old would write now. And it's, uh, and, and so I decided that my wife and I should follow his route across the United States. Um, it probably would have gone more smoothly if I had planned it better. Um, in fact, some of the details of the trip <laughs> became <laughs> so difficult that, and so last minute, I mean, uh, the Trails West organization actually supplied me with trail guides when I discovered three days before we were going to leave that these trail guides actually existed. 
supplied them to me depending on me to actually pay for them. Uh, they, they sent them without me actually having paid, um, trusting that I would in fact, uh, do exactly that. And, and, and that was my first experience of trails organizations and also my lasting experience with people involved with researching America's trails, whether it's the Oregon Trail or the California Trail. It's just how generous everybody is with information, with location, with how to find things, with the, you know, that it is a shared experience. So that was a great discovery as well. Could you talk a little bit about the process of going through those diary entries and figuring out how you wanted to include them in your book and like how because you you do a really good job of kind of connecting it to your experience as you and your wife are, are following along um, in in his footsteps. The idea at first it. was that it was going to be pretty free form, that we just go and start to trip and follow from there. But I had neglected in my calculations to figure out what happened after St. Joseph, Missouri. I could make a, a, a really solid list of the trail that he took from Fond du Lac, you know, to a steamship, to the wrong way up the Mississippi to Dubuque, all the way back down to St. Louis, to St. All of the towns were listed. You could track everything. But of course, in 1849, those towns ended in Missouri. And after that, he was simply following the trail and ge- geological features. And suddenly it got much more difficult to, to find parts of the route and which small portions he used. Um, the idea was really that we would just go and follow the, the route and do what he did, which was when the day ended, that's where you stayed. Um, wherever we, we had no pre-planned real direction or reservations or, or anything. Um, and we, you know, we would end up where we got tired at the end of the day, much like he did, although he was always looking for, for food and, and water and fuel. Um, at the end of his day as well. We usually could find those in a pretty straightforward way. Did you find it kind of weird, that juxtaposition of going through these diary entries and seeing uh, geological features that were the same, but kind of experiencing different um, like cultures going through these different towns. You do a really great job talking about all of the different experiences and like interacting with people. And you say that everybody is kind of waiting to share how they fit in to yes. like their history, which I think was just such a fantastic line. Um, and but, it really kind of encapsulates what this is about. I mean, people would talk about towns that their parents had founded or places they had worked or other things that they had done. I like how you talk so much about how this is you're following like an immigrant story, a story about immigration. And then you also have a connection to that because your family immigrated um, north out of America. Uh, right. When you were younger. Um, and so. I think a lot of I think that a very defining aspect of being from an immigrant family. I mean, obviously, there's exceptions to the rule, but um, I think there's like a sense of isolation when you've immigrated away from where you are. I don't know, indigenous to where your family is indigenous to. Um, and I think you really capture that in your writing, talking about, you know, how you're looking for this family connection um, and that just fits in wonderfully in today's context with just issues about immigration and America in general. And you're, you know, you're going on this really long journey, mirroring what your, your ancestor did, William Castle Dodge. Um, did that bring up any, any feelings or any, like, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, interestingly enough, my father, my father's family were also immigrants. They were from, from Pripyat, which is, I mean, I, I use the description. It's sort of like the old Bugs Bunny cartoon. Um, it was halfway between Minsk and Pinsk, but they were from Starniki, a small village that doesn't exist anymore. And then when dad's family immigrated to Woonsocket, Rhode Island and worked in sh- uh, shoe mills there, um, dad was in, a, in an all Italian neighborhood and was really kind of singled out because he was a big Ukrainian guy. Um, and it, you know, it, it's funny, the area that he, he had found in America to make his family had found in America to make their home was actually also the home to another group from yet another country who had made it their, their home as well. Um, and I mean, 
I think more than anything else, the sense I got is that humans are always on the move. They're always going from someplace to somewhere else that they think might be better. It might not happen in every family. It might not happen. You know, there may be people who spend every day in the same town that they were born in and eventually die there in their 90s on the front porch in a rocker. But an awful lot of people are moving constantly to new places, new opportunities to try new things and often to hope that they're they're better things. And America is in the midst of that again. And right now, I mean, you know, there are, there are people coming to America to, to, to find the same better place that William Castle Dodge was looking for, a place where they can, you know, have their, their parents live out a comfortable old age, uh, well supported by their children. It's, uh, you know, that, that part of the story doesn't seem to change regardless of where you're from. Do you have like a favorite passage from his diaries that really stood out to you when you were first kind of like going through to organize and figure out how you wanted to lay the the book out? Probably the one that struck me the most is there was a there was a small part where he said he had traveled 10 miles in a day um, to to find water and it found damp earth and and a, a circle of dead oxen around <laughs> it. And I just thought, you know, is it was there ever a point where um he just said, and he doesn't say it in his diary, but there must have been a point where he had said, must have said, what have I gotten myself into? You know, yeah. why am, why am I out here? I mean, by the time he was finished his trip, his teeth were loose, his health was poor. Uh, he wasn't, you know, there wasn't any bit of good food left to be had. Um, what there was was bad and expensive and, you know, to me, the parts that struck me, and sometimes he would find just incredible beauty. Um, it seems to have 18, 1849 crossing that portion of the United States seems to have been a, a really bad year for storms. I mean, he was talking early, early in uh, the very earliest parts of the of the diary about his coffee cup of water freezing solid in the night. And, uh, you know... The parts that struck me the most were when I would suddenly wake up and think, wake up in reading it and think, this guy is 22 years old. This is 22 years old and he's decided to basically walk across a continent that doesn't even have states yet, doesn't have towns, has a few forts, and that he's completely trusting that the wheel ruts he's following are going where he wants to, wants to go, even though month after month and time after time the distance seems to stretch out he thinks he's 200 miles from the gold fields then it turns out he's 400 but no he's not 400 he's 500 um he's being plagued by crickets and can't sleep because of wolves and uh, and you just think wow for a a 22 year old it must have been both amazing and uh and and frightening but he never let he, he lets on about the amazing he doesn't talk much about the frightening um and I, I must admit, I felt nowhere near as threatened, no matter what sort of uh, hotel or road or dark place or lo- getting lost in the desert, which we managed to do a couple of times. Uh, I didn't feel anywhere near as threatened as he must have. That's something that you don't really think about until you like really sit down and read these firsthand experiences when it comes to things like the Oregon Trail or the Gold Rush, because... I mean, the Oregon Trail is such a pop culture thing now because of the video game. And, you know, it's like, oh, you died of dysentery. But when you sit down and really read people's experiences, it could be quite horrifying at times. And it was it was a difficult ordeal. And a lot of people never saw their family like that. They left back wherever they they started out from. Like a lot of people never saw them again. Um, And also just making it to the end of the journey was uh, an achievement in itself. So yeah. I I think it's really fantastic that you have this like full account like these this full diary. And I didn't even get to use all of it because at the he I I ended the diary portion when he decided to leave the gold fields and left from San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, but after all of the troubles he had crossing the United States, after all of the deprivation and danger and everything else, he got on a sailing ship to go to Panama and cross the isthmus there and come back uh, to the east coast of the United States 
but was becalmed for like 49 days and they <laughs> ran out of water and biscuits. So oh my it's gosh. Just, so it just seemed like having finally escaped from the gold fields and the poverty that he was in being, he was suffering there. He was once again in danger on the ocean of dying and yet something else. So yeah. It, uh, yeah. That's, where I, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And now you can just like hop on a five hour flight back to New York. <laughs> Well, and, and when I, ho- when we hopped on the flight in, in Sacramento and flew across the United States and you could see all of the, you know, the, the ripple of every bit of hill, mountain, valley, river, every, and little, essentially little specks of the ground he was covering in terms of you knew that this, this was the Rocky Mountains and you knew that this was likely South Pass on the Rocky Mountains and, and, from the air, and it, it, you're right. It's gone in minutes. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's an app to get to get across his entire route. And for him, it was all you know, an entire summer, spring and summer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and was this your first kind of like deep dive into traveling through America? Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes, it was. Um, and it was and it was a bit of a strange one because, like I said early in the process. Um, it probably required a lot more planning than we actually gave it. I, I sort of thought we would just get out and follow the diary and there, there you go. Um, <laughs> but it, it got a lot more, um, complex. Uh, we get, we got better at it with each passing day, but, uh, you know, when you leave, when your very first move leaving the airport in Green Bay is to turn the wrong direction, <laughs> it kind of sets a tone, you know. For, for where you might end up. And you definitely saw America at a very interesting point in modern context because you, you said that when you first set out, it was, what, two months out from the 2016 election? Yep. So definitely a lot of tensions, I'm sure, as you were traveling through the country. Well, one of the things about it is my wife was working on a different project and was really interested in what people would say. Mm-hmm. about politics in in small town america in and larger <laughs> larger town america even st louis um uh, st louis being one of the biggest cities that that we passed through and and so she was always ready to engage always ready for conversation always ready to listen in and what was remarkable during that election period was strangely nobody nobody seemed willing to talk uh presidential politics it, it, it was eerily quiet. I mean, we saw a lot of signage on private property and, you know, how the election unfolded in, in, in that part of the country, very red. Um, but it wasn't something that was publicly de- debated a lot. It was a strangely silent world. I think twice, I think twice the topic came up in places where we were. And one of them was basically someone saying, I wouldn't vote for anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, but it was a it was a charged time in that way for sure. Um char- both charged and quiet. Well, I'm wondering so so you set out with this goal of of getting more of like a family connection or a, or a historical connection to your family and do you feel did you feel after you completed the the route um and and now with the book about to come out do you feel like you are satisfied with what you got out of the experience? It's funny I uh, I didn't the very for the first trip. We ended up uh, making portions of the trip, uh, adding on more travel further down the line. Um, and it wasn't until uh, the third time that we were we were on the road, which was in the fall of 2019, just before the pandemic. And it was even it was way off the route. It was, I just happened, we did, my wife convinced me that we should stop and visit my brother in Phoenix before going north to the Nevada desert too. There were parts of the Nevada desert that were impassable, uh, really significant parts of the route with real interest to me uh, to see that we just couldn't get near uh, in 2016 or again in 2017. So we went back in 2019, but we started in Phoenix and saw my brother there my younger brother and uh that's when the pieces sort of started to fall together 
because we did have the same stories. And more than that, we're, we're quite similar in our physical stature, in our mannerisms. Um, and we did finish each other's sentences and we did remember the same stories. And it was suddenly, it was a, a, dis, a discovery that the, that family existed, but for me, it's just a much smaller, it's a node. <laughs> I don't have uncles and aunts and cousins that play into it the way, for example, my wife's family does incredibly. Um, but for me, it may just be that the unit is a smaller unit, um, but it's there. And so, yes, there was success at the end, but not, not just at the end of the first trip, at the end of the first trip, Getting back on the plane, I, I remember thinking, I, I wonder where I go from here. What do I do now? You know, I've, I've come all this way. It's, it's not a cheap process and maybe I have no book. You know, mm. <laughs> I mean, I still have the diary and the travels with the diary, but did I find what I was looking for at the end of it? At that point, I wasn't sure. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit like uh, taking DNA tests. You know, everybody hopes that there will be a clean and clear and obvious solution and here's the connections and everything. And often it isn't. It isn't, you know, and, and sometimes the things you hear from family aren't even true. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, someone will tell you, well, there's this connection in your family and then genetically there isn't. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a, it can be, a, you know, and I, I think that one of the things about searching for connection is that there are also a lot of there are a lot of false trails and there's family lore and things get invented by members of the family and you don't find out that they're an invention for for years and that was actually one of the things that that sort of dogged me and i think dogs anyone who's working with a diary Mm -hmm. is that diaries i think people naturally want to be a little bigger than they are and there's always this sort of thread of, you know, okay, I'm going to present it exactly as it is. I mean, I've cleaned up some of the diary notation because he referred to everybody by a single letter. All mm-hmm. of his traveling, Inglesby would become I. It'd be Inglesby first reference and I throughout the rest. And, and rivers would be abbreviated to two letters, SR for the, for the Snake River. But it wasn't big, but Big Sugar River and Muddy Creek. Everything would be abbreviated, but I tried to keep everything intact um except for when he's basically saying it's a bad day again today it's very dry it's a bad day again today we didn't go anywhere those ones i did sort of but i I kept the rest of it because either he's telling the truth or he's not um either he's aggrandizing or he's not and i'd like to believe that he wasn't Uh, but like most people he may have been there are parts of the diary where he does seem to be blowing things up quite a bit in terms of his lofty goals. I mean, I think one of his main goals for going was the excitement of it. He and a bunch of other young people decided they wanted to go, so they went. And, you know, a a month in, he's talking about how his only, all he wants to do is find gold to bring home so his parents can have a comfortable retirement from in thanks and gratitude for raising him. And you're, you're going, yeah, well, I don't think that's actually true. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you're, you know, blowing a bit of smoke here, but I kept it all anyway in that sense. The other thing is that the American West, when you, you hear about it and you think about what you see in movies and everything like that, I just fell in love with the Western desert. I mean, just everything so beautiful the light so straightforward the colors so simple and mixed together in a a palette pretty much like behind me here but a little <laughs> lighter in color um uh, just a just a you know browns and sedges and yellows and ochres and oh we'll be back again and we've been back three times to the desert around gerlach and we'll certainly be back there again uh, northern utah will be back too as well I'm so glad that you found this connection and, and you're you're going back and you'll be back again. Do you have um, Instagram or like any social medias that people might want to follow you at? <laughs> I I have a rather strange Twitter account called at Wengerski. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's everything from strange beer cans to mayflies to things <laughs> I find in the ocean. Um, there's there's no consistency to it at all. Sometimes it's Canadian politics. Often it's not. 
it's it's just basically what I see day by day. I can't say enough about trails organizations because there's just such a rich amount of information and knowledge and so readily available when before you travel, you actually take the time to look, <laughs> which Definitely. I recommend. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. Our mission at Okta is to protect the historic emigrant trails legacy by promoting research, education, preservation activities, and public awareness of the trails, and to work with others to promote these causes. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube at Oregon California Trails Association, and on Twitter and Instagram at Okta underscore 1836.
do you have um, 